It's, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, I thank uh, the Institute, Dr. Rogers, uh, Dr. Coulter, and others for inviting me today. It's a real treat and honor to speak today um, at uh, THI, Texas Heart Institute Grand Rounds. Um, yeah, nine years ago when I, you know, <laughs> was thinking about moving here and had THI on my speed dial, um, I guess uh, it's sort of uh, come to full fruition giving Grand Rounds today. So today, the topic uh, that I'd like to talk about is pulmonary hypertension. And uh, really, uh, what I wanted to talk about was left heart disease and pulmonary hypertension um, and uh, the pathologic convergence of these two processes um, and some updated um, sort of information on the disease. So um, let's start off. And I just wanted to give my disclosures. Um, I have uh, some connections with Abbott, Impulse Dynamics, and Janssen, um, but I will not be talking about uh, any off-label use of any uh, devices today, uh, nor will um, uh, my disclosures have uh, any impact on this talk today. So I'm going to start with the case presentation, um, just like in most grand rounds. And so this is a 57-year-old gentleman that uh, Matt and I took care of, along with a, a number of other uh, folks here. He's a 57-year-old gentleman with a history of mild left ventricular dysfunction. He's got a uh, history of multiple prior ablations for atrial fibrillation uh, throughout the state of Texas, actually. And uh, he came in, um, he also has significant mitral uh, regurgitation, uh, and he presented to an outside hospital with uh, acute decompensated heart failure. Uh, he was found to have severe pulmonary hypertension um, by uh, echocardiography and later by um, invasive catheterization. And uh, you can see there, um, pretty severe increase, 94 over 43, um, with a mean of 63. And this cardiac index was 1.3. Um, a mitral valve intervention was uh, um, contemplated, but uh, ultimately declined due to his profound shock and severe pulmonary hypertension. He eventually required an impella 5.5 for support uh, and LVM loading, and he was transferred to our center. Um, we instituted several meds, including sodium nitroprusside, inhaled nitric oxide. Um, genetic testing was um, interestingly positive. Uh, he had um, uh, HCM uh, gene mutation, and a repeat catheterization was performed. Uh, eventually, he was listed for just a uh, heart transplant alone and underwent successful orthotopic heart transplant. This is catheterization. You can see here with uh, um, the initial catheterization followed by the implementation of additional therapeutic measures, um, we were able to bring his PA pressures down. And um, interestingly enough, um, this um, was his pathology on explant. Uh, he had significant endocardial fibrosis with uh, calcification of the left atrium. This was actually apparent on a CT scan. And um, he had um, focal uh, subendocardial calcifications in the left atrial tissue. And on the right there, you can see a lot of uh, significant replacement fibrosis in the LV. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that this is a very deranged left atrium and um, a very non-compliant left atrium uh, with absolutely zero reservoir um, that was there. Um, and uh, fortunately, he did extremely well post transplant plant um, with um, complete uh, restoration of normal PA pressures. Uh, so um, this is uh, the slide comes from um, our pathologist, Laura. Thank you for this. Um, and this case was presented by one of our residents, Claire, at ACC, Claire Scott. So thank you, Claire. So I'd like to get to the outline and hopefully in the next about 40 minutes or so, we can talk about uh, some major things as far as left heart disease and pulmonary hypertension. First, I'd like to start with definitions, and there's been a change in the definitions uh, for pulmonary hypertension. I'd like to talk about exercise followed by pulmonary hypertension and left heart disease, why it's relevant. As far as the pathobiology, is there a spectrum of the disease as well as diagnostic approaches? And then finally, some therapeutic approaches uh, to uh, left heart disease and pulmonary hypertension. So let's start off with definitions, why the change? And so the Europeans are always ahead of us sometimes. Um, and um, they recently published towards the end of last year, their updated guidelines uh, for the diagnosis and treatment of pulmonary hypertension. This is uh, 
quite a manifesto, uh, like 60 pages, whatnot. Um, but, um, you know, a, a very uh, nice uh, sort of um, comprehensive summary for the diagnosis and treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Um, every uh, At the bottom there, every few years, um, the World Symposium Pulmonary Hypertension brings together the experts on pulmonary hypertension so they can provide further revision of um, guidelines and management of pulmonary hypertension. And so really with these guidelines, um, they still um, talked about five sort of basic classifications for pulmonary hypertension. Group one, this is the pulmonary arterial hypertension. I have a large clinic. Um, I know Heidi's in the audience, takes care of a lot of patients, um, but this is not really the focus of the talk today. So again, it's not group one pulmonary arterial hypertension. Group two, now really three entities involved. Pulmonary hypertension from left heart disease um, breaks down into hef pef, hef ref, and valvular heart disease. Group three, those with hypoxia. Group four, chronic thromboembolic or obstructive disease and then group five, a miscellaneous category, which is really um, multiple different pathologies uh, coming together, um, uh, resulting in pulmonary hypertension. But really, when you look at pulmonary hypertension, the crux of the disease, about more about 1% of the world has some degree of pulmonary hypertension or significant pulmonary hypertension. But really the focus, and this is why most of my practice is uh, um, primarily group two pulmonary hypertension when I do get called for pulmonary hypertension. If you look at most of the world, about 50% of most of the pulmonary hypertension that you'll see is going to be due to left heart disease. So there's really, uh, despite the fact that we've had an explosion of therapy for pulmonary arterial hypertension, really, I think the uh, golden goose is how do you really um, treat uh, left heart disease and pulmonary hypertension? So again, here, this comes from a study from um, Australia, uh, showing sort of the etiology of pulmonary hypertension uh, is assessed by ECHO. And you can see here close to 70% of these patients undergoing TTE were eventually diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension from uh, left heart disease or group two pulmonary hypertension. So getting to the definition, so the um, uh, European Society recently updated the definition, and I think this is really interesting, uh, the amount of work that went into this, um, as well as the use of databases. So really, um, prior to this, in 2013, really the definition of pulmonary hypertension was a mean PA pressure of 25 or greater. This was reduced to a mean PA pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury. And this applies for all different categories of pulmonary hypertension. In addition to that, they also um, outlined that these different categories for left heart disease and pulmonary hypertension. So if you go from left to right, so pH 20 millimeters of mercury, pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, that's the type that um, the um, orphan drug use um, sort of category, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, these are the patients that I have on Flolan and uh, all sorts of specific therapy again, smaller group, but really in the middle there, um, what they brought out was two different classifications. One was isolated post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, and then um, also combined pre- and post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, the CPCPH. And then finally, they reintroduced what's called exercise pulmonary hypertension. So I just want to go over these entities, and uh, you can see there that uh, with exercise, what they brought in was a mean PA pressure over wedge pressure slope. So isolated pulmonary hypertension, this is the type that we pre predominantly see uh, in our heart failure patients, high PA pressures, high wedge pressures, um, pulmonary vascular resistance less than two Woods units in the cath lab. CPC pH is those patients who have a high um, PA pressure, high uh, wedge pressure, but their pulmonary vascular resistance is two Woods units. So two Woods units is also important because if you look at prior definitions, uh, the Woods units um, cutoff was three Woods units. And this has changed to lowering that Woods units category to two Woods units. So something else to keep in mind. So they lowered the mean PA pressure as well as the Woods units. Along with that, this introduction of exercise pulmonary hypertension. So where does this come from? So where it comes from is a large study by Kovacs and colleagues. 
Um, they looked at a number of healthy subjects um, across an age spectrum and found that the normal mean PA pressure, this is uh, several thousand um, patients, uh, is around 14 um, plus or minus three. So two standard deviations above that is 20 millimeters of mercury. And these uh, sort of mean PA pressures are relatively preserved across age groups at um, rest, although there's a variability that happens with exercise. So again, mean PA pressure around 14 from that study, cardiac output 7.3, and a PVR about 0.93 for most of our normal patients. So if you look at that um, by echo category, this also comes from Australia, that um, if you have incremental increases in your right ventricular systolic pressure, there's an increased uh, mortality uh, with that. But if you start swanning these patients and doing right heart catheterizations, they found that there's increased risk for pH progression. This was shown here in this study from uh, the VA where they looked at a number of patients over time um, on the left there by um, um, uh, Swan-Gans catheter and the right the same. They saw that those patients who had PA pressures that uh, were above about 19 millimeters of mercury um, had a decreased probabilities for survival over the subsequent 1,500 days. So again, if you've got pulmonary hypertension, it's probably going to progress for most patients, and anything above 20 is going to lead to um, adverse uh, outcomes over the subsequent uh, uh, year or so. And this is a nice study. This came from uh, a large VA database um, from uh, Bradley Marin and colleagues. And they showed uh, the uh, progression of pulmonary hypertension uh, in these patients. Again, on the left there, the probabilities for survival was decreased if your mean PA pressure was even in the 19 to 24 category. And then on repeat cath uh, catheterization on the right there, you had progression. So this really holds true for a number of different entities across um, sort of our entire sort of pH spectrum that um, uh, applies for scleroderma, pulmonary fibrosis, post-MI. So the other thing that they uh, found by looking at this database, and this was a large U.S. veteran study, so they um, took a U.S. veterans database um, on the left there, about uh, 32,000 patients, and also looked at a Vanderbilt database as well, and showed that uh, the other thing besides mean PA pressure above 20 was that if your pulmonary vascular resistance was elevated, and here the cutoff was 2.2 Woods units, that you were also at increased risk um, for uh, mortality. So again, these are two sort of large articles, databases that showed um, with validation um, using um, uh, external databases here in uh, Vanderbilt that a mean PA pressure greater than 20 and a PVR greater than two Woods units was associated with uh, increased mortality. And uh, this, again, uh, shows that uh, the highest uh, sort of risk are those patients who actually have a mean PA pressure greater than 20 um, and uh, pulmonary wedge pressure less than 25 in the middle there. So now we talked about why the definition has changed. The next thing that's important, I think this is something practically that we can talk about, is exercise. Is there an importance of exercise as well as provocative testing, left heart disease, and pulmonary hypertension? This is a graph that I think most of you have probably seen if you've ever been part of a pulmonary hypertension or RV failure talk. And uh, you can see here the importance of doing um, catheterization. And as our RV starts failing, our pulmonary vascular resistance increases, cardiac output decreases, and our right atrial pressure decreases, uh, increases. Now, the other thing, too, is uh, to keep in mind the following is diagnostic evaluation of catheterizations, group two pulmonary hypertension. I put this up. This is, uh, you know, pretty self-evident for most, but I think it uh, really sort of emphasizes the importance of provocative testing in the cath lab. Now, we do this um, in heart failure quite a bit, but I think it's very important that, um, you know, once you diagnose pulmonary hypertension, you isolate the etiology, and then after that, do appropriate vasodilator testing dep depending on the type of group that you're looking at. So in our um, sort of talk today, we're talking about group two pulmonary hypertension. And those patients that have passive um, pulmonary hypertension, um, 
you know, you move forward. Um, but in those patients have significant component of, of a high pulmonary vascular resistance. It's important to not only uh, do vasodilator testing, but use the appropriate agent. So in our lab, we use sodium nitroprusside at times, milrinone um, as a bolus. Uh, the agents not to use um, if we're dealing with left heart disease would be inhaled nitric oxide um, or um, epoprostenol, for example. So again, the importance of looking to see if your patient is vasoreactive. So the other thing is confrontational testing, and this is something else that we've done uh, quite a bit um, in, our, in uh, our heart failure workup. Number one is fluid challenge. It seems simple, but there's a lot of data behind this. And one is the administration of fluid um, to really um, bring out whether your patient has uh, true pulmonary vascular disease versus a uh, heart failure um, phenotype. And in a lot of cases, what we're dealing with is whether the patient has true pulmonary arterial hypertension versus those patients who may have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and a component of pulmonary vascular remodeling. So fluid challenge can be very important. And this, um, a couple of studies here, they found in the, this Italian study that if you actually saline load these patients um, and they used seven mils per kilo, um, that uh, within about 500 cc's, those patients that had abnormal diastology actually raised their pulmonary capillary wedge pressure to greater than 18 millimeters of mercury. So again, something very simple to do, 500 cc's, and most patients will raise their uh, wedge pressures greater than 18 if they've got underlying uh, pathology, um, including uh, diastolic pathology. And on the right there, they showed the following in that most patients, um, and this comes from a U.S. study, that in most patients who are healthy, really uh, the rise in wedge pressure won't be that substantial, but will fall typically under 15. But those patients who have HEFPEF, will have a significant rise um, in, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the fluid challenge. The next thing is exercise. And this is something that came uh, in vogue early on. And then in the last uh, pulmonary hypertension guidelines, they excluded, but it has re-entered sort of the norms thanks to a lot of great work done by a number of centers, including um, uh, actually Milad's mentor, Ryan Tetford, uh, Greg Lewis, and others. So uh, the basics are um, you, um, have a patient that comes to you that's dyspneic, and obviously the cath lab only represents for the most part um, sort of uh, resting physiology. So it's important to do confrontational exercise testing to bring out uh, pathology. And I know some of you have been part of, um, you know, sort of our exercise tests in the cath lab. Um, Javid's picked up the bike for us a few times, Matt suffered through it. Um, but I think we get a lot of good information um, from exercise. and. Um, and this was shown by, uh, I think this came from the Mayo Group, um, and they showed that exercise is superior to saline and eliciting hemodynamic changes. That's, again, self-evident. But a few other things that have been shown that's more specific, and this comes from um, Greg Lewis's group, is the prognostic significance of exercise. And so if you look at these patients who undergo exercise, so um, what uh, they did at MGH and other uh, centers have um, validated this, um, if you Take a patient, uh, and these were patients that came in, uh, they underwent invasive um, cardiopulmonary exercise tests. Um, if, they, uh, if you exercise them, their wedge pressure um, uh, uh, should go up a, a certain amount. Typically, most normal patients increase their wedge pressure and then um, it falls back. But in those patients who have uh, significant pathology, the wedge pressure increases and that slope is greater than three. So this is something that we do in our cath lab where we look at the rise of a run uh, for these patients. We have invasive hemodynamic monitoring during exercise. We have a supine bike and do our exercise. And what we're looking for is that rise of a run. So what does our wedge pressure do in relation to our cardiac output? And if that number is greater than three, uh, which ends up being three Woods units, this is something that has significant prognostic um, implications. Um, and, uh, and what Greg found was that a slope greater than two demonstrates worse functional capacity. Uh, and the hemodynamics correlated to CPET and you had worse event-free survival if that slope was greater than two. But for further clarification, if you looked at age groups, that cutoff became three Woods units. So patients, uh, if you exercise them, do a mean PA slope to cardiac output, 
And if that number is greater than three, that represents significant pathology. And further breakdown on the right there, you can look at uh, sort of separating that as far as what's a pre-capillary component and what's a um, um, post-capillary component. So on the left, you look at wedge pressure over cardiac output slope. And if that number is greater than um, anywhere about two Woods units, um, that's um, uh, significantly abnormal. And uh, on the right there is the pre-capillary component. If it's uh, greater than 1.2 Woods units, uh, it may indicate a uh, pre-capillary component. And again, both of these are associated with uh, worse survival. Uh, and on the right there, um, it may unmask pulmonary vascular disease as well. So again, so we can do these things in um, the cath lab and they have significant prognostic implications. Obviously an exercise test is a little bit more difficult to do, takes equipment. Um, there's a lot of age variation in sort of the results there, um, but um, you reproduce um, sort of uh, normal pathology. On the right with fluid load loading, it's easy, um, minimal misinterpretation. Um, there may be some age dependency on sort of uh, your outcomes. Obviously it doesn't represent uh, sort of a um, um, uh, sort of an active state. But again, these two things are something to think about at the time of catheterization. In addition to that, some other variables have been um, shown to have significant um, uh, sort of implications as far as pH and left heart disease. So those include the following. Now, um, on the top are sort of our normal parameters that we look at when we're evaluating patients with heart failure who are undergoing um, evaluation for LVAT or transplant, cardiac filling pressure, um, our PAPI, um, PA pulsatility index, pulmonary vascular resistance. But a few other things that have some implications are your diastolic pressure gradient, PA compliance, as well as PA elastance as well. So diastolic pressure gradient has sort of come, come back and forth into vogue. And we'll kind of uh, talk about this uh, initially and get back to this at the end. So there is a lot of emphasis on the diastolic pressure gradient. So diastolic pressure gradient, what is that? It's a difference between uh, your PA diastolic and your wedge pressure. So um, initially um, in the several years ago, they thought that the diastolic pressure gradient had significant implications, uh, but uh, work done by Tedford and others have shown that uh, diastolic pressure gradient may not have a significant impact on how patients do as far as um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is concerned. And this diastolic pressure gradient sort of um, you know, represented pulmonary vascular disease. So you've got a big difference between your PA diastolic and your wedge. And so if that number is greater than about seven, it was thought to represent pathology, but this really hasn't been shown in um, Hopkins or UNOS you know, database studies. Some of the other things that have been shown um, include the following. One is um, pulmonary arterial elastance. And really the concept goes from a, a sort of a static state uh, where your you know, RV is pumping um, and you're looking as a static state versus what are really the ar arteries doing? Are they compliant? What is their elastance? And uh, in this study, they showed that uh, pulmonary elastance, um, which is your systolic uh, PA pressure divided by this uh, stroke volume was an additional predictor of mortality. And uh, in addition to that PA compliance, which is a stroke volume uh, divided by your um, PA systolic minus your diastolic pressure, uh, basically your PA pulse pressure, um, that is your PA compliance. So these two variables had significant prognostic implications. Why? Because the RV responds to uh, sort of uh, the pulsatile as well as resistance loading and really uh, sort of increases in that lead to RV as a uh, PA RV uh, discoupling, which ultimately leads to PA uh, RV failure. So in that sense, uh, these two numbers really had a greater impact uh, potentially on outcomes. So next is uh, just a few things to round out is cardiac output in the FIC equation. So keep in mind that this is more of uh, those of us who do CATS in the lab. And uh, this is something else that uh, a number of people have looked at. We commonly do FIC equations, and these are indirect FIC equations, right? Um, our VO2 is um, calculated based on a formula, and we uh, measure a cardiac output um, based on that. <clears throat> 
So um, in this study, this also came from the VA. Um, they found, uh, they looked at uh, what was uh, actually more predictive of outcomes and do these two numbers correlate? So actually, interestingly enough, um, they found that the FIC and the TD actually didn't correlate um, uh, many times and there was a 20% uh, variation between the methods. However, if they looked at prognosis, the thermal dilution was actually more um, uh, predictive prognosis than your FIC. And so this was uh, something that was interesting. And so if both were low, your FIC and your TD, then um, that um, those patients had um, the highest uh, mortality rates. So something else to keep in mind as far as when you're really evaluating these patients, I know we don't do term and dilution as frequently in our cath lab just uh, due to time constraints, but it should probably be based on this study, the standard as far as measuring cardiac output and index uh, in patients that don't have intracardiac shunts. All right, so I'd like to talk about the next uh, part, which is pulmonary hypertension and left heart disease. Is it relevant? And I think uh, for the most part, we know that it is relevant. And um, so obviously, uh, this comes from a paper from 1936, uh, I believe. And uh, we know sort of the in initial um, sort of uh, descriptions of pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular disease as it related to left heart disease came from mitral stenosis. Uh, these are um, obviously histology autopsy specimens uh, from someone with mitral stenosis uh, showing changes in the pulmonary arterioles that were um, uh, showed significant uh, remodeling. Um, now, throughout the years, there have been a number of studies showing the implications of uh, pulmonary vascular disease and left heart um, uh, in left heart disease. You can see there on the right there um, with uh, the um, presence of pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary vascular disease, and these were all invasive studies uh, that you had an increasing hazard ratio for death um, of, uh, in left heart disease. And in this study here, this was from Pittsburgh, they showed uh, they did right heart catheterizations in about 10,000 patients. Uh, these are predominantly uh, HEF-REF patients, 26% HEF-PEF. They showed that uh, in those patients that had significant um, elevations in their uh, transpulmonary gradient, their pulmonary vascular resistance, as well as their diastolic pressure gradient, this is associated with increased mortality and hospitalizations for these heart failure patients. It obviously has implications with congenital heart disease. Um, we know that with congenital heart disease that any form of pH um, is associated with um, increased mortality. Um, this is from the Toronto group. Uh, if you just look at ECHO itself too, uh, a number of studies have shown uh, the increasing risk of mortality in HEFPEF and HEFREF uh, with higher PA pressures. A few other things in our case here, we talked about at the beginning was our gentleman who had um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, this was a smaller study from the Boston group that showed that um, there are a number of patients that can have um, pulmonary hypertension. These are patients that they looked at who are undergoing right heart catheterization prior to septal reduction therapy for obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And they showed that there was a significant presence of pulmonary hypertension. It was a short study, it didn't immediately impact outcomes after septal reduction therapy. But interestingly enough, about 11% of these uh, patients had a phenotype that was very uh, sort of um, interesting, and it was more of a pulmonary arterial hypertension phenotype. And uh, these patients had very low wedge pressures and uh, very high PA pressures. Pulmonary vascular resistance was greater than three Woods units. And the authors really couldn't uh, describe why these patients had that, um, but uh, you know, hypothesized that there was additional vascular remodeling that was occurring in these patients that led to this phenotype. And that certainly is the case with our case presentation that we presented, and we had several other patients like that as well, HCM patients. So something that I think is very interesting and obviously um, uh, food for more um, sort of research. A few other things, obviously, we are a very large TAVR center, um, and I've been, you know, asked by Dr. Plana a few times to come uh, to the meetings. And so, obviously, it has an impact on TAVRs as well. Um, and in this uh, look here, they looked at uh, the uh, PA dilation, and they found that um, those patients that had PA dilation, CT 
um, uh, PA dilation greater than 29 uh, millimeters of mercury. They had an increased risk uh, over the next two years and the highest mortality were in those patients whose PAs were dilated, as well as those patients who had high PA systolic pressures as well. This is another study from uh, Benson colleagues that showed that those patients who went for TAVR that had um, PVRs that, that were greater than three Woods units had increased um, uh, cardiovascular um, adverse events. Uh, in this other study here, they showed that um, actually the importance was um, of, I'm sorry, um, in those patients that had different groups of pulmonary hypertension and those patients who pre-TAVR um, actually um, had evidence of reversibility probably did better than those patients um, that had fixed pulmonary hypertension. In this uh, study from 2022, they looked at 565 patients and um, as far as pulmonary hypertension and normalization after TAVR, they found that most patients, actually about half the patients normalized their PA pressures after TAVR. But interestingly enough, there are a few predictors uh, of residual pH, including atrial fibrillation and um, baseline moderate tricuspid regurgitation, which is interesting because it really implies that the left atrium is abnormal. In addition to that, the RV is already remodeled. Um, in, uh, in addition to that, uh, patient prosthetic mismatch was um, a um, nidus for uh, the development of new onset pulmonary hypertension in that group. Transcathodal mitral valve repair, um, that also pulmonary hypertension is common. And again, if you've got um, higher levels of uh, PA pressures, and in this group, uh, they looked at uh, ATS ACC database. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Sammy, uh, who has co-fellows with uh, Maria, and uh, Sammy looked at this and uh, found that in those patients who had mean PA pressures greater than 45, these patients still underwent um, fairly successful um, um, transcatheter mitral valve repair, um, but uh, were at increased risks uh, subsequently for mortality and readmissions. And I think we all know sort of the implications of pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular disease on transplant. We know that those patients who have pulmonary vascular resistance greater than um, uh, six Woods units are typically contraindicated for transplant. Uh, however, we have a few patients, uh, excuse me, however, those patients who are reversible in the cath lab will subsequently likely improve their PVR at one month and one year. In addition to that, left, uh, left ventricular assist devices, we've shown in our um, sort of database uh, that those patients who have pulmonary vascular resistance that are elevated, what really drives sort of adverse outcomes are those patients who have PVRs in the absence of mitral regurgitation. Uh, typically, we'll uh, look for um, a normalization over the uh, subsequent three to six months. Um, but I think um, in our subgroup here, an elevated PVR in the absence of MR was associated with mortality. So a few other things that are specific as far as working up uh, sort of the presence of pulmonary vascular disease in uh, these patients is uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And this is something that uh, in our clinic, we obviously can't do right heart cats on everyone that comes in that's suspected to have pulmonary vascular disease. Um, in certain centers, such as Boston, uh, Duke, and others, they uh, do uh, level three CPETs, where you can do cardiopulmonary exercise testing with the presence of a swan in place. But even without that equipment, a simple cardiopulmonary exercise test can actually unmask, you know, potential pulmonary vascular disease. And in this uh, study, they showed that uh, the VEVCO2 slope was associated with pulmonary hypertension in HEFREF. So something that we'll use quite a bit is the VEVCO2 slope, um, numbers greater than about 35 and uh, greater may be uh, indicative of significant pulmonary vascular disease. So um, the pathobiology, is this a spectrum of disease? And I think this is where really things are sort of changing in um, sort of our um, look at pulmonary hypertension and left heart disease. So it's thought that uh, this comes from a uh, sort of a cartoon about 10 years ago uh, from uh, Dr. Borlaug and others, uh, showing that you initially have a passive increase in your PA pressures followed by reactive pulmonary hypertension and then out of proportion pulmonary hypertension. 
And so in our patient who came, uh, we saw sort of left atrial remodeling. And this is an example of a stiff left atrium. Uh, this is a stiff left atrial syndrome that uh, we've seen post uh, afib ablations, amongst others, where, again, the importance of exercise in these patients. You have a patient uh, at rest, relatively normal PA uh, wedge pressures, and in the presence of exercise, increases their uh, wedge pressure significantly and rapidly. And you can see those elevated V waves. And so all of this implicates um, abnormal diastology, but more than that, also implicates um, a left atrium uh, that's non-compliant and has no reserve. A few other things is that um, in the presence of atrial fibrillation, interestingly enough, the wedge pressure near LVDP is actually abnormal. And this is shown here um, where you actually don't have a correlation um, when you're in atrial fibrillation. So it implies that uh, AFib um, really um, creates a major impact on the left uh, atrium as well as, as far as its reservoir is concerned. In addition to that, the prognosis is also important where um, your um, wedge pressure, but not your LVDP was associated with outcomes. So again, I think uh, it really gets back to the left atrium being the path, uh, one of the pathologic chambers here that's causing a lot of problems here. And this is shown here again, if your resistance is higher, your reservoir is lower on the left there. And your, if your total ejection fraction, total um, ejection fraction is uh, decreased, that correlates to higher um, pulmonary vascular resistance as well as um, abnormal capacitance. And then with that, um, sort of there becomes a spectrum of disease, like I said, and this is a Comprera registry. This is a big European registry of pulmonary hypertension. And they found that um, in their registry, they had a lot of patients who had pulmonary hypertension, and this is that group one category, but they were older, had a lot of risk factors for HEFPEF, obesity, diabetes, et cetera. And then you had those patients who got into the registry that just had HEFPEF, but had pulmonary hypertension, and really, there was no survival difference amongst this uh, different categories of patients um, um, <laughs> after a sort of um, uh, additional uh, risk adjustment was made. So again, a disease process that behaves at least similarly or has the same outcomes. Um, so getting back to that diastolic pressure, this was interesting that these patients with these diastolic pressure gradients, this gap between their PA diastolic and wedge pressure, in those patients, from a pathological standpoint, if you looked at um, their autopsies or um, uh, if you looked at their pulmonary arterioles, they had greater degrees of remodeling. So it implied sort of remodeling both on the arterial end as well as the venule end and the higher DPG in this category that it was associated with uh, worsening outcomes. This is a study from the Mayo 2. They looked at a number of patients uh, with different disease categories, HEFREF, HEFPEF, and they looked at something called pulmonary venoocclusive disease. Now, pulmonary venoocclusive disease is typically a group one pulmonary hypertension category. These are patients who get uh, uh, remodeling both on the venous side as well as their arterial side. Some of them are genetically based. Um, and scleroderma patients a lot of times behave like this as well. And in these patients, when they looked again at their arteries and veins, they found that the remodeling was very similar between the two groups. So that you've got pathologically remodeling that's happening and it's associated with um, worse outcomes as well. So again, pathologically disease states that behave very different, uh, very similarly to uh, what's called pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. And the um, venous remodeling correlated to hemodynamics. So again, this is uh, getting back to the original uh, sort of cartoon that I showed. You get a loss of compliance, stiffening, as well as uh, arteriopathy, as well as venopathy that leads to sort of progressive pulmonary vascular disease. And it can happen with HEFPEF and HEFREF. With um, HEFPEF, uh, you start um, uh, with a pulsatile load. You've got a really stiff, remodeled, um, non-compliant left atrium. You may have a resistance load and have ref, um, a larger left atrium, but nonetheless, the remodeling does occur. And um, as you remodel, you go from a state of coupling your uh, RV to your PA to an uncoupled state. 
And this is something interesting. This is uh, from a Vanderbilt study. They showed that they had a number of caths that were done. They showed again that uh, combined pulmonary, um, pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension, they had more vascular disease than um, isolated pulmonary um, uh, isolated pulmonary hypertension or isolated uh, post capillary pulmonary hypertension, despite the same comorbidities. But they also looked at uh, SNPs and they found that. Um, when they're looking at these different SNPs, uh, their uh, sort of profile, their molecular profile with the CPC pH was very similar to their pulmonary arterial hypertension patients. So again, um, you know, maybe suggesting that uh, in those patients that have combined pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension, uh, that these patients may need to be treated or at least um, approached in that PAH category as well. And there are a lot of pathologic contributions. Obviously, this is something that, um, you know, a slide that's a little um, busy here. Um, but the ultimate thing is that wall stress and shear stress lead to endothelial dysfunction, smooth muscle cell hypertrophy, and inflammation. So what do we do about it? So then diagnostic approaches. Um, so first of all, you want to look at your pretest probability for left heart disease um, and the left heart uh, of uh, left heart disease phenotype. Do these patients have just purely HEF-PEF? Do they have pulmonary vascular modeling? Or maybe they have pulmonary arterial hypertension. And so you can look at their age category if they've got comorbid conditions such as obesity, hypertension, diabetes, prior um, revascularization, atrial fibrillation becomes important, structural left heart disease, um, ECG, echo, their CPET results, again, uh, VEVCO2, uh, the presence of uh, exercise oscillatory ventilation, cardiac MRI as well. And then you can really take that and figure out, are these patients actually typical IPH, atypical IPH, where they have pulmonary arterial hypertension, but they may be a bit older, have these comorbid conditions, or are they really a PH HEFPEF category before you sort of um, go after a, a treatment regimen for these patients? So again, looking at their risk factors. So a diagnostic approach to this includes identifying overlapping clinical phenotypes, uh, determining the pretest probability, as well as the hemodynamic characterization in appropriate cases. So this comes from uh, the World Health um, uh, Symposium um, and uh, sort of an algorithm that we can use as far as uh, looking at these patients, whether they have pH with HEFPEF or pH with HEFREF. And you can look at those risk factors and if they have a high uh, sort of um, risk factor burden, disease uh, burden that suggests um, left heart disease, you manage that. Uh, if it's intermediate, no RV abnormalities, you can consider right heart cath in select cases. But if they've got RV abnormalities, the right heart cath is recommended. They do recommend going to an expert center um, and uh, there the cath, um, uh, that's done can be uh, separated into the following. If the PA pressures, uh, wedge pressure, sorry, is 13 to 15, if they're low probability, then they have just isolated pre-capillary pH. So treat their heart failure, uh, intermediate to high, you can't really exclude HEF-PEF um, with uh, significant pulmonary vascular disease. So you may want to do your provocative testing, exercise, fluid load, et cetera. And if they have a wedge pressure greater than 15, uh, then, um, uh, you can um, uh, say whether they have low or intermediate high probability, again, consider doing an LVDP. Um, and if they are high probability, then um, pH uh, uh, HEFPEF has been con um, uh, confirmed. So next, what are therapeutic approaches? And uh, yeah, I had the opportunity last week to uh, go to a um, ISHLT workshop, um, and a nice algorithm was sort of outlined by Ray Benza, who's done a lot of work um, in the pH and left heart disease space. So it's really a three-pronged approach. Number one is going after your left atrial pressure. Uh, number two is to treat the underlying heart failure condition, uh, HEFPEF, HEFREF, valvular heart disease, address comorbid conditions, and then target uh, vascular remodeling and select patients um, to improve and protect the RV. So we've done a few things that you can do. Um, 
One is non-invasive monitors, impedance monitors. Um, obviously, in the center there, what these things are uh, sort of getting at is uh, adjusting diuretics, reducing your left atrial pressure uh, through um, that, as well as other guideline-directed medical therapies. And then PA sensors, cardio MEMS. Um, we're part of this uh, Cordella trial here. Uh, we've done several implants. So PA sensors to improve uh, uh, sort of disease management. Um, the other thing that uh, is sort of novel is intraatrial septal device trials. Um, these are uh, sort of really uh, kind of blowing up in that space. And uh, we were part of the reduced LAP HF2 trial, um, which was sponsored by a company called Corvia. But now there are multiple different um, uh, intraatrial septal device trials uh, that are going on um, in that uh, TEE was our patient who underwent an IAS device. So the reduced LAP HF2 trial was actually the first one large trial that's really been published. Um, so a few things, they found that the IAS actually didn't improve um, um, uh, cumulative incidence of heart failure, didn't reduce heart failure events in the patients with HEFPEF. But uh, what they did find was that in post hoc analysis revealed that patients with a peak exercise PVR of less than 1.74 Woods units might represent a responder group. And we were on a paper with uh, Dr. Borlaug. It's sort of, you know, it's an interesting, I mean, you exercise these patients and you get them to 20 Woods units. If your um, PVR is greater than two Woods units, you're not going to do well with the device. If it's less than two Woods units, then you may do okay with the device. Um, and so really, I think what it got to was the following is that uh, if your RV couldn't handle that extra shunt, then you weren't going to do well. And uh, those patients who didn't do well with the shunt were those that uh, sort of classically fit those patients who have, uh, who are older pH patients, such as males, um, and these patients didn't do so well. So again, we'll see where this space goes as far as intraatrial septal device uh, trials are concerned, but certainly something to address left atrial hypertension. Obviously, the crux of everything is getting to guideline-directed medical therapy, and we've got, uh, without uh, reviewing everything in uh, the limited time we have, it includes the implementation of guideline-directed medical therapy, revascularization device, um, as well as ablation therapy, um, and then uh, uh, addressing valvular heart disease. Uh, lifestyle modification rehab, and then uh, using appropriate uh, therapies beyond that uh, to um, optimize uh, the patient's substrate. And then again, speaking of PA sensors, this is an interesting trial that Dr. Civitello was on looking at um, uh, SGLT2s. This is the Embrace HF trial uh, sort of substudy. And they found that with the implementation of SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, these were patients that had cardio MEMS in place. You can see um, uh, without additional therapy, a reduction in um, PA pressures thereafter. So then finally, what um, gives as far as uh, um, vascular modeling is concerned in pH therapies? And I, I bring this up because this is uh, sort of a typical sort of consult or a frequent consult that I get. Does this patient need pH-specific therapies? And as I mentioned, there's been a significant increase in the amount of PA um, uh, pulmonary vasodilators over the last several decades, which really has taken the field of pH to a disease that was you know, ultimately fatal to something that can be managed, um, although it is progressive still. And we've got our PDE5 inhibitors, endothelin receptor antagonists, prostacyclins, and then our cyclic guanolate, uh, soluble guanolate cyclase stimulators. However, the fact is, is that all of these drugs so far in pH with left heart disease has failed to provide an improvement um, in patient outcomes. So you had an early sort of indication that maybe sildenafil helped, but in larger trials, they found that uh, there was really no improvement um, in uh, major cardiovascular endpoints uh, with the use of sildenafil. Uh, Riasaguat, which is otherwise known as Adempis, again, no change. That drug as, as well as Verasaguat has not uh, panned out as far as um, HEFPEF is concerned. Massatentin, that's an endothelin receptor antagonist. That's something that has uh, that is still under study. However, initial look at it um, saw that it was associated with uh, fluid accumulation in the active group. So again, these uh, drugs really currently 
have no specific place in most patients with pulmonary hypertension who have left heart disease, but there may be a category of those with significant pulmonary vascular remodeling that may be candidates. Now this, um, with sildenafil, they found that uh, in a number of different um, cases, HEFPEF, as well as those patients with, he with HEFREF, the sildenafil didn't really do uh, much. Um, there was a reduction in systemic afterload. There was a reduction in LV contractility and no difference in afterload on contractility. And I think a lot of the problem with this is sort of isolating uh, the right phenotype for these patients. And trying to isolate that, um, you know, there are gonna be further studies looking at, um, you know, sort of uh, pH therapies in this population. Uh, one drug that, um, you know, we were part of as far as this trial is the teratocept, and this is a active and receptor type 2 fusion protein. Um, it's basically a uh, active and ligand um, that uh, actually gets to the heart of uh, pulmonary vascular remodeling in pH patients. And um, uh, this is uh, a therapy that was shown in um, this phase 3 trial uh, to actually have significant benefits in uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension patients. And uh, currently they have a phase two trial looking at pulmonary hypertension and left heart disease with this drug. And it'll go into a phase three trial to see if those patients who have combined pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension may benefit from this drug, which had significant benefits in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. So getting back to those European guidelines, currently, uh, it's a little busy. What they say is that in those patients who have um, potential HEFPEF, additional testing with exercise and fluid challenge should be considered. Uh, drugs approved for pH are not recommended um, for all patients who come in. And um, in some of these patients that have uh, combined pre and post capillary um, you know, it's really use at your own discretion. You have to really sort of think about the patient and what they have going on before the implementation of um, uh, these therapies. So to summarize, number one, so the definitions have changed. So the mean PA pressure is now 20. The exercise and fluid loading is important to assess pulmonary hypertension with left heart disease. Um, it obviously causes a major impact in those patients with left heart disease. And really now pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension may represent a spectrum of disease. So it may be um, sort of this pathologic convergence of um, sort of everything moving uh, that way. And you need to really take a three-step approach to the diagnosis uh, and treatment. And further studying includes, you know, maybe exercise, MR exercise TTE, which is surprisingly absent uh, from a lot of the guidelines, as well as MRI, and then further um, look into pH therapies for uh, combined pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension. So um, I want to thank you guys again for the uh, opportunity to speak today. Sorry, there's it's almost time. Uh, we may have time for a few questions. I also want to thank um, uh, everyone. I know Heidi's here, but all the uh, heart failure nurse coordinators who helped with the management of these patients, as well as the Baylor Office of Clinical Research that's helped us with all our trials and appreciate the time today.